Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I am Krish Mohan. Before we dive into this week's episode, I just want to let you know that if you want to financially contribute to the show, you can do so by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. For only $2 a month, you get exclusive, unreleased stand-up comedy content and early access to the longer, more in-depth episodes of Forkful of Noodles. Go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha and consider becoming a patron today. Thank you very much, and let's dive into this week's episode. Trends. We see trends everywhere. You know, fashion trends tell us what garments are so cool that the average citizen can never really afford them. Because obviously coolness has a dollar value attached to it, you know? Uh, the, the more commas in a number, the more coolness is attached to it, right? More commas, more money, more problems, and obviously more coolness. We also have the trend of exes showing up in your life just when things are, are looking good, you know, just to just to shake things up. Okay, take a hint, exes, okay, and just move on. It's going to be okay. We're all happy now, and you can be happy too. It's, it's just not with us. Okay, I know that got a bit too real for some of us, but, but we're going to be okay. One of the largest trends that a lot of people seem to ignore is in the trends of capitalism. And much like the fashion trends, these trends are only for cool people. And in terms of capitalism, coolness is determined by how close to death you are, where you land on the sociopathy spectrum, and whether or not you look like the Monopoly man. Speaking of which, why haven't we seen the Monopoly woman yet? I mean, it seems like the second that feminism started trending, the elites would have assimilated this idea to avoid the pitchforks, right? I want to see a monopoly woman because sociopathy and greed uh, don't really see gender, right? Only humans are obsessed with the idea of which gender is greedier than the other. I mean, the competition of greed is like the epitome of greed. That's the only way you can win greed and the board game Monopoly. Anyway, according to my favorite economist, Dr. Richard Wolff, there is a trend in capitalism that only the soothsayers of the upper class can see. Market crashes. And in the realm of capitalism, the market crashes every seven to eight years. The last crash was in 2008, and now Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase are calling for yet another financial crash in another year or so. Well, the, the capitalist system has a downturn every four to seven years. It's had that for, for centuries. And the last big downturn was 2008 and nine. So if you do four and seven, you add it to nine, we're due for one. And every major uh, stock market observer, bank, and so on predicts that we're having a downturn. So it's really only a question of exactly when. And the stock market anticipates this. And so we're having, in a way, economic chickens coming home to roost. And the notion that it's just the Fed's policy that explains this is really the kind of remark that would get a student a very low grade in any economics course. Are we in the midst of recession, or is it just about to hit us? It's just about to hit us. Goldman Sachs is literally predicting it. J.P. Morgan Chase, you mentioned these institutions before, they're all saying in their newsletters, if you read the financial press, it's not a question of whether, it's just a question of when, and it's sort of within the next six to 18 months. So, yes, it's possible those will be wrong, but, you know, it's been that way for a couple of centuries. It's a good bet. And so, yes, we're going to have one. Okay, is it odd to anybody else that big banks and financial institutions are basically calling for an economic downturn but still want us to invest in an economy that's going to fail? 
I mean, this is like taking a flight, and as you get to the airport, you find out that the wings of the plane are on fire. Okay, don't don't get on that plane. I, I find out why the wings are on fire. Get some answers about this, right? But all we're told to do is get on the flight and buckle our seatbelts. Like, that's going to do anything. All that's saying is that we should strap into our demise. Based on this information alone, the only product that we should be investing in that should be flying off the shelves are mattresses. So we can all hide our hard-earned minimum wage money from the big banks that once again are hedging their bets against the economy that they run. As Professor Wolf points out, this is exactly what the market needs because at this point, the driving force of the market is debt. Not only at the advent of credit cards, but also the fact that the 08 c- collapse was the product of the debt bubble bursting. In a way, the last 10 years have been an economy on life support. Vast amounts of money pumped into the economy, record drops in interest rates, inviting everybody, business, individuals, governments, to borrow money, a a debt-sustained situation. And we have a long-term instability built into this economic system, and we look to be on the verge of doing just that kind of downturn that history suggests. And it doesn't matter if you had your receipt or not. There was no returning from that. I mean, after 08, a lot of us just said, hey, guys, look, I think you need to take this economy back, okay? We we think it's broken, and we didn't do anything to it. In, in fact, we actually left it at your place a few weeks before it broke, and, I mean, we didn't even get to use it all that much. And the banks basically said, no, 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 you guys go ahead and keep that one. I mean, that's our gift to you, you know? It's our, it's our gift to you. We're going to go to the government uh, and ask for a new one that, that works for us instead. But, but our bill is, uh, is in the mail for that gift we gave you. And uh, can, you, can you cover lunch, by the way? Can you get this one? Because we are super short right now. But don't worry. Don't worry. You'll be propped back up when we push trickle-down economics again. Debt is also important because it creates a cycle of desperation to land jobs at any pay rate. After the crash, a lot of people had to return back to the job market, and they did it by taking whatever job they could. And this happened to a lot of college kids, too, who couldn't get jobs in the field that their degree was in, so they worked at whatever job was available. I mean, that's like dating your best friend. Right, just because they're there all the time, you know, there's no real passion in it. But but there is a lot of convenience and a membership card. That's what basically getting a job at like Sears or or any fast food restaurant or or Starbucks is. They're just there all the time, right? Eventually, we just go fine. Yes, I will settle. My maybe maybe now my mom will stop being disappointed in me. I had this problem. Uh, not the best friend issue. Uh, I was in the best friend zone, which uh, is like the uh, negative zone from Marvel Comics and the phantom zone from DC Comics combined into one, uh, but for your heart and penis. I, I, I had the problem of not getting a job uh, in the field that I went to college for, right? I, I worked at a shoe store with a very expensive graphic design degree. And the people that were buying $200 leather shoes that, that were part of the problem did not care that I thought the logo of the brand was a little too aged and didn't fit with the contemporary trends in design. Creating desperation to accept people back into the job market is essential for capitalism to keep funneling money upward like a a reverse tornado that blows through creating uh, more inequality in its path rather than destruction you know like the destruction is there but but it's more of a a byproduct just like how cursing and death threats are a byproduct of traffic when it's created by a, a light dusting of snow People lost their jobs in 2008 and 2009 and a lot of them are now back in the labor force but a lot of white men, uh, about 30 to 55, didn't go back in because they wanted better jobs or at least the same quality of job that they had before. 
But eventually the wells of compassion dry out and out of desperation, they have to take a job at lower pay. This means that corporations don't have to raise minimum wages as long as they create desperate economic situations. This is like that abusive ex that reminds you that the only reason that you've been single for a year after they dated you isn't because you're more career-oriented and have your life back in order, but it's because you're unlovable and only their magic genitalia can save you. Listen, you are lovable and you are worth it, both economically and romantically. Okay, don't don't date capitalism, okay, again, all right? Not, not until they go see socialism for some therapy sessions. Okay, so we've addressed some of the problems that surround the trends in capitalism and how they affect the job market, but what can we do about this, right? What are some solutions to this problem? I mean, are these just perpetual trends that we can't get rid of? You know, like the indefinite return of jean jackets and ponchos? Will capitalism ever stop calling? We've blocked their number like 12 times. Take a hint. Well, no, not really, but this might surprise you that there is actually a rich person out there that is on the side of the working class. Uh, Nick Hanauer, whom some of you might know from his band TED Talk, actually addresses how we can work on a middle out economics. But before we get to that, let's learn a little bit more about Nick Hanauer himself, right? Why should we trust somebody from the upper crust of society? Side note, by the way, you should always trust the upper crust of a pie because they are just delicious. Hanauer is an entrepreneur who invested in various companies and started innovative companies over the years. He was the first non-family member to invest in Amazon. He put in about $45,000 and was on the board till about 2000 He left cashing out his stocks at over $300 million, which begs the question, was Nick Hanauer restraining the greed and evil of Jeff Bezos, right? And since Hanauer was the first non-family member to to invest in Amazon. Does that mean that if we look into the genetics of Jeff Bezos' family that we might be able to find a gene for evil? And, and let's be honest with ourselves, doesn't Jeff Bezos just look like a younger Monopoly man? Hanauer has co-founded over a dozen companies, including A Quantitative, which I think I'm mispronouncing, uh, but it's, it's okay because he sold that to Microsoft for $6.4 billion. Like most plutocrats, I too am a proud and unapologetic capitalist. I have founded, co-founded, or funded over 30 companies across a range of industries. I was the first non-family investor in Amazon.com. I co-founded a company called The Quantive that we sold to Microsoft for $6.4 billion. My friends and I, we own a bank. I tell you this, <laughs> unbelievable, right? I tell you this to show that my life is like most plutocrats. I have a broad perspective on capitalism and business, and I've been rewarded obscenely for that with a life that most of y'all can't even imagine. He has been a constant advocate for the $15 an hour minimum wage and spent a lot of time funding uh, ideas and ventures that have interested him rather than just making himself richer and richer. Imagine if most people were able to earn this kind of money, right? What would we invest in? I mean, if you claim that all people would do is eat Cheetos all day, masturbating while playing video games and occasionally learning how to play Wonderwall by Oasis on the acoustic guitar, then you're no better than King Republican and neocon poster boy Paul Ryan. You also don't have any faith in humanity and are contributing to the problem of keeping people unenthused in their passions and their own intelligence. I mean, look at Nick Hanauer, who had billions of dollars. He didn't have to do anything. I mean, he could have sat at home and pleasured himself to his own renditions of Oasis covers, but he's not. He is looking for a better purpose for himself, the, the purpose to help people reach a place where the work they do matches the pay they get, right? He's investing in people to, to be on an equal footing so they can invest in the things that they are interested in. 
Nick Hanauer is one of the proofs that a progressive economic strategy will work. Okay, so what the hell is middle out economics, right? This is the idea that rejects the neoclassical model of the capitalistic economy that has booms and busts and works mechanically, right? It basically suggests that working on bolstering the middle class will mean a steady and more consistent economy. And instead embraces the 21st century idea that economies are complex, adaptive, ecosystemic, that they tend away from equilibrium and toward inequality, that they're not efficient at all, but are effective if well managed. This 21st century perspective allows you to clearly see that capitalism does not work by effectively allocating existing resources. It works by effectively creating new solutions to human problems. The genius of capitalism is that it is an evolutionary solution-finding system. It rewards people for solving other people's problems. The difference between a poor society and a rich society, obviously, is the degree to which that society has generated solutions in the form of products for its citizens. The sum of the solutions that we have in our society really is our prosperity. And this explains why companies like Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple and the entrepreneurs who created those companies have contributed so much to our nation's prosperity. This 21st century uh, uh, perspective also makes clear that what we think of as economic growth is best understood as the rate at which we solve problems. But that rate is totally dependent upon how many, how many problem solvers, diverse, able problem solvers we have, and thus how many of our fellow citizens actively participate, both as entrepreneurs who can offer solutions and as customers who consume them. But this maximizing participation thing doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by itself. It requires effort and investment, which is why all high, highly prosperous capitalist democracies are characterized by massive investments in the middle class and the infrastructure that they depend on. So this trend of, of banks and financial institutions predicting a crash wouldn't be the norm, and neither will it be accepted. It means by encouraging those in the lower and middle classes, companies can fund and invest in their employees who drive innovative progresses forward rather than exploit them for the vague idea of the greater good. The advancements we'd make would go up exponentially, and it starts by paying employees what they're actually worth rather than just a meager amount so that the people at the top can keep the fruits of the labor. Hanauer's idea is pretty simple, right? If you pay someone a livable wage, then the employees themselves can afford the company's products, right? Right now, they can't, which means that there is no money moving around the economy, right? Rich people don't buy more stuff than poor people. In fact, they probably buy less. They themselves are the average consumer. I earn a thousand times the median wage. But I do not buy a thousand times as much stuff, do I? I actually bought two pairs of these pants, what my partner Mike calls my manager pants. I could have I bought 2,000 pairs, but what would I do with them? <laughs> How many haircuts can I get? How often can I go out to dinner? Which means, for having all of that wealth, they don't do much to improve the economy, despite the fact that they are far more capable of doing more to help the economy than you or me. In fact, by hoarding that much wealth at the top, they're actually doing a disservice to the economy because now there's less capital moving the gears of capitalism. 
which in turn is why capitalism has to invent things like credit and debt and is renewing the new season of hoarders, which of course is focusing on how the wealthy have hoarded all of their money and are crippling economies, right? It'll, it'll have to be a YouTube show because most corporate TV won't show you the truth. And eventually it'll be the platform for calling bankers and corporate elites a bunch of money-grubbing greed parasites giving society the constant diarrhea of inequality. Should be a pretty good show. Growing inequalities will lead to a neo-feudalist state. That's basically what happened to France back in the day, right? People who were at the bottom led a violent revolution to equalize the economy and get to a more prosperous life. And if the trends of the current economic regime c continues, that's where we're headed. There's no uh, examples of lasting inequalities, right? They will lead to a violent revolution or a police state. Look at France again. They donned on super bright vests to let the elites know that we're here and we see your bullshit and we're not taking it anymore. Middle out economics would mean that the econom economy isn't in a constant state of flux, right? Nature is about balance and we are part of nature. Henceforth, we should act like it. We have created an economic force that rests in imbalance and is due to implode. And based on the way things are right now, we're racing to see which of those concepts is going to win out, right? Which Amazon will be the global force, the forest that holds more secrets than the vastness of the internet itself, or the website that is collapsing both the internet and the human soul. Giving people the ability to have a livable wage would mean that cooks and servers of high-end restaurants can actually afford the food they cook rather than just be slaves to gluttons. Apple employees can afford the computers and phones they make, fix, and sell without going into debt or giving up a few meals. And I'm sure there's a couple of us out there that would be very willing to give up a few meals to, for the ability to tweet with our thoughts, but we shouldn't have to. And by the way, tweeting at the speed of our thoughts would be the worst idea ever. Okay, do you, do you know what's in our thoughts? Okay, Twitter would become a porn revenge oasis cover band site in a matter of seconds. The opposition of this idea claims that giving the rich tax breaks will allow them to reinvest in their employees, and that's a great way to boost the economy. I mean, if that idea was valid, then it would have worked the last 30 times we tried it. Okay, tax cuts to the rich only help the rich get richer and wear their avarice on their sleeve like a shitty insignia of inequality. Since the 1980s, the wages of CEOs have increased by 500%, and the wages of workers stay stagnant. The minimum wage hasn't gone up in a lot of states in over a decade, and meanwhile, the price of damn near everything keeps going up. Trickle-down isn't working for, uh, for when the top has all the money, and there's none for the people at the bottom making them the money. Okay, paying people a livable ma wage means less unemployment, less welfare state, better taxpayers, and more innovation for all of us to enjoy. And this has proven to work. Washington State, where Nick Hanauer has participated in rallies for a $15 an hour livable wage, has shown improvement in increased wa wages. Washington State's minimum wage is $12 an hour at the start of 2019, compared to 9.32 in 2014. Unemployment is 4.6%, which is 2% lower than it was in 2014 when Hanauer's TED Talk came out. Increasing the minimum wage decreased unemployment which means if we actually get to a livable wage, which is well over $15 an hour at this point, we'd probably have way less unemployment across the country. And the term trickle-down should have alarmed us in the 80s, right? All they said was, was that there, there was going to be these, these small droplets of money that would return back to the people infrequently, you know? Like, like the economy has a swollen prostate, and the rich 
are continuing to keep it swelled up. You know, someone needs to stimulate the the economy's prostates here. You know, so so it can release what we need. Okay, all right. Sidebar: I am not saying that we need semen to survive, right? I'm not saying that's what we need to to move. It's just an analogy, so all the third wave feminists out there can put down their tablets and just relax. There is proof time and time again that trickle-down economics doesn't work. In fact, Dr. Richard Wolff suggests a trickle-up economics. I mean, these are ideas that were presented back in the FDR days, right? The, the 30s and 40s, giving people jobs that matter. We have been following, and unfortunately Democrats too, something called trickle-down economics. We do economic policy where we help the folks at the top. We bail out the big banks, we give a tariff benefit, we, and we hope it trickles down, which it rarely does. First thing they can do, reverse it. Let's do trickle-up economics. You help the people at the bottom in all the different ways that we know how to do, because the FDR regime back in the 30s did a lot of that, so we know how to do it. Like? Do it. Well, put people to work. Put people to work doing socially useful things at a decent income. Not working in a fast food restaurant under un unbearable uh, personal situations. Here's another one, the screening of America. There's a project that could help millions of people in a direct way. Let's kind of do that. Put forward by a democratic socialist, a socialist Absolutely. like yourself. And that's where we'd expect it to come from, because we haven't been willing, outside of the mainstream, to have the debates. So, uh, excuse me, in the mainstream, we haven't had it. So we need the folks coming in that are new and different to talk about all of those things. We did them before. The minimum wage should be raised and dramatically. Automation is coming whether we like it or not and that's going to lead to another round of job loss and market crashes unless we figure out how to get more Nick Hanauers to invest in innovations created by the middle class. If we invest in people and things like the idea of the Green New Deal which would mean that a new crop of jobs that create a sense of purpose pay well with benefits, you'd probably have a populace that could afford to keep the economy stimulated and chugging along. This means that they spend money on culture, education, arts, and the government, right? With middle out and trickle up economics, we might not go extinct and be worthwhile to the planet again. Side note, again, uh, I am aware that there are some issues with the Green New Deal presented by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the New Democrats, but I'm talking more about the concept of having good-paying jobs in a world of sustainable energies and ideas. What most people don't realize is that even a CEO is replaceable, right? If everybody is supposed to be able to move up the ladder and get richer and find a better life, right? If upward mobility is true, then the plutocrats are just as replaceable as everyone else. And if that were the case, then these plutocrats would be uh, for the idea of buffering up the middle class so they aren't fully replaced, right? Perhaps we should just automate the rich, Maybe a robot could run a corporation more ethically because it would realize that the concept of greed is counterproductive. The trend of poverty should be a rarity, not the wealth of meaningful, well-paid jobs for the people. Uh, that's been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you very, very much for tuning in. Uh, this is the the first episode in quite some time uh, that I have put out of this uh, of the show. We took a, a, a longer hiatus than um, than I wanted to, but thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, uh, please give it a like. Please give it a share. Uh, sharing is the best way to uh, help out shows like this, independent DIY, socially conscious comedy content. Uh, that comes out every single week. Sharing helps it reach newer audience members. Uh, you know, share it with your friends, share it with your enemies, share it with anybody that you think would uh, would benefit from hearing uh, th this kind of content. Uh, but another way to help this show is by donating to the Patreon. Uh, go to patreon.com slash krishmohan, ha ha. Uh, this show does not have any sponsors, and I'm the only employee on this show. Uh, I do all of the research, I do all of the writing, I do all of the recording, the audio and video editing, the uploading, and the promoting. Uh, that is basically the job of like five or six different people being done by one person. 
so if you want to help fund this show, uh, make it better, increase the quality and quantity of this show, uh, please go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha and consider becoming a patron today. We have no corporate sponsors. We have no sponsors, period. So essentially, we are sponsored by you, the people. We are people-sponsored. Uh, and I will be uh, performing live stand-up comedy. I am on tour currently right now uh, through the Midwest. If you want to come see me do uh, live socially conscious stand-up comedy, uh, I uh, will be in Des Moines, Iowa on April 24th at the Gas Lamp. On April 25th, I will be in Omaha, Nebraska at the B-side of Benson Theater. On April 26th, I will be at Boss's Comedy Club in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. On April 27th, I will be at the Club Underground at Spring Street Tavern in Minneapolis, Minnesota. On April 30th, I will be at Blush in Duluth, Minnesota. On May 1st, I will be at Puddler's Hall in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And on May 2nd, I will be at Communication in Madison, Wisconsin. And then I'll be opening for Lee Camp in Chicago at the Beat Kitchen on May 3rd and 4th. And uh, I will be opening for Lee at the Independent Comedy Club and uh, Planet Ant in Detroit, Michigan. For my entire tour schedule, you can go to ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com. Uh, and uh, check out all of my tour dates. Get your tickets, RSVP to the events. Uh, it's always nice to, to see fans of the show. Um, come out and hang out and chit chat and continue the conversation after the show as well. Um, and thank you again for tuning in. Uh, it, like I said, it's been a little while since, uh, since I have done a, a full episode and I'm still getting back into the swing of things. Um, I apologize if things were a little chippy choppy on this episode. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be back. I'm very excited to get back into the, into the regular swing of things and put out episodes more consistently uh, every single week um, and release them out to you guys. Uh, and uh, once again, like I said, if you enjoyed this content, please share it, please like it, please get the word out there. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys again. Uh, check out the links below. Check out uh, my Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, and all that stuff. And uh, till next week, we'll see you on the road.